We're going to go with mine. So mine, mine says we're about time. So. Well, good morning this morning. We're glad to have you here with us to worship the Lord together this morning. And glad that you are starting off your new year uh, in the right way. And I can't think of a better year, uh, way to start off the new year than worshiping the Lord together. Amen. You may notice that I don't quite look like Pastor Brian this morning. Uh, and so if you would continue to pray for Pastor Brian and for his family, his grandfather passed away this past week. Uh, they were, he was able to make it up there and spend a little bit of time together there with them uh, before passing away. But this week, Tuesday and Wednesday, is the visitation and the service for them. So be praying for uh, Pastor Brian and for his family there with that this morning. Uh, let me, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 145. Um, and there in Psalms 145... It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. And that's what we've come together to do this morning is to declare God's mighty acts, to worship and to celebrate Him together this morning. So let's worship the Lord together. <clears throat> Song, uh, hymn number one, praise the, to the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, come to His temple, draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that hath life and breath come now with praise as before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for a we adore Him. And number three, worthy of worship. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring, you are worthy. Father, Creator, you are worthy. Savior, Sustainer, you are worthy. Worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Worthy of reverence, worthy of Worthy of love and devotion, worthy of bowing and bending of knees, worthy of all this and added to these, you are worthy, Father, Creator, you are worthy. Savior, Sustainer, you are worthy, worthy of warfare and worthy of worship and praise. Almighty Father, Master and Lord, King of all kings and redeemer, 
wonderful counselor, comforter, friend, Savior and source of our life without end. You are worthy. Father, creator, you are worthy. Savior, sustainer, you are worthy. Worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. And how great is our God, number five. The splendor of the king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all that earth will know how great is our God. Age to age he stands. And time is in his hand, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, and Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all name, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great is our God. Oh, and Polly's our special singer. <laughs> Amen. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed? On your knees till the light shone through. How long has it been since your mind felt at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? How long has it been since you knelt by your bed? And pray to the Lord up in heaven.
How long since you knew that he'd answer you and would keep you the long night through? How long has it been since you walk with the dawn and felt that the day's worth the living. Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 1. Before we get there, we're going to have to take the opportunity to go to the Lord in prayer as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I, I hope that you continue to pray for uh, we've got several folks that are out traveling, and, and we know that some are getting ready to travel. So be praying for them as they're uh, on the, the roads there, that God will keep them safe. God will bring them safely back there with them. It, this is also the beginning of the new year, and, and uh, I, I don't know about you. I, I don't usually do a lot of resolutions, but I think a new year is always a great opportunity to kind of stop and to reevaluate, to maybe set some goals or some opportunities to look at some things like that. And so let's be praying for that as we look at that this year. I think it's always a great opportunity to kind of look back over the past year to say what things went well, what things could we done better, and then kind of look towards the new year and to say, God, what do you want us to do here as we move here into this new year? And so with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity just to be able to gather together. And God, what a privilege it is to be able to worship you. We thank you for each of these that have made you a priority this morning, have come out to worship you and to give honor and glory to you. Lord, we just pray that you would just be be with them, that you would bless them and encourage them for having been in your presence and and are putting you first at the beginning of the year here. Lord, as we look at this new year, God, may you uh, take first place in this new year. May we uh, kind of set goals and reevaluate priorities to put you back into the place where you belong, which you so richly deserve. And God, may we live that out throughout the rest of this year as we begin this journey throughout this year. Lord, we pray for those who are traveling this year, that you would just protect, watch over those, whether they're uh, kind of gone away for the winter, whether it's uh, for a short term, or whether they're just unable to make it today to, to worship, or that you would just protect, watch them over them, and bring them safely back as we gather together as a family to worship you, Lord. Just pray that you be with our time together this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, before I get into that, let me just share a couple things with you. One is this, is uh, throughout the Christmas season, we have had the Christmas mailbox downstairs there in the hallway. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't checked that, make sure you take the opportunity to check that. Uh, you may have some Christmas cards and some other correspondence down there in that. And that, that will probably be going away here soon in the new year. So, we, you know, we're not exchanging the Christmas cards like we usually do. Uh, and so kind of take the opportunity to just make your way down to the hallway, check that out. You may be surprised you may have a Christmas card down there uh, as well. And so uh, we're in Galatians chapter 1. We're going to take the opportunity to begin looking at Galatians and just kind of working our way here through the book of Galatians and I, I believe that as I was studying and preparing for this, that I understand just how timely this is as we look here at the book of Galatians. Just past week, um, I had the opportunity to read, often read a lot of the, the news articles there on my phone, and I was, I was reading there. Um, some of you may be aware that uh, the Pew Research Organization often does kind of a yearly state of affairs type uh, polling and research. And one of the things that they found out this year was that there, again, was a steady increase uh, in the number of people that have no religious affiliation. Um, we call this the nuns, right? Not, not the Catholic Church nuns, you know, the ladies in the black attire. Uh, but these are those who, when asked what is their affiliation, they would say none, that not, none of the above. They, they don't have any type of religious affiliation, no denominational affiliation, no... Uh, in particular religion. They're not Christian. They're not Buddhist. They're not. Uh, and it was interesting because I was looking at this. They're not even atheists. So be careful. Don't confuse these with atheists who 
refuse and reject God. These are just kind of like a, a smorgasbord of pick your own spirituality. They would consider to be spiritual but not religious is uh, sometimes what they like to classify themselves. And so I was reading an article about it. It was from CNBC on their digital uh, feed there with that. And it was uh, that millennials are leading the way in the nun category. Of millennials, about 30% of them now claim to be no religious affiliation. And the, the article was written by a, a Jesuit priest uh, writing for uh, CNBC. And it was interesting as I was looking at it because they looked at kind of across the religious spectrum. They you know, talked to uh, practicing Jews. They talked to a, a liberal Christian. They talked to a Buddhist. And uh, they kind of, you know, as the newspapers often do, you got the broad spectrum of view of things. But it was interesting as I was looking at that and reading some of those things uh, to see what was taking place. And uh, one is they talked to a, a pastor of a uh, liberal church or of a uh, there, and um, it was interesting seeing what she said. The, the pastor was a woman, Reverend uh, Jackie Lewis, and, and uh, one of the things she said, there's no topic off the table. And, uh, but what I found interesting was this, right? We put social justice, democracy in the middle of our faith in a way that really speaks to young folks, Lewis said. We've done an incredible amount of campaigning, the right to vote, the right to choose for women, immigrants' rights, and racial justice. And then it went on to say this, that while Lewis said her teachings were inspired by the Bible... Her approach is a progressive political side, emphasizing spirituality and community over Scripture. And uh, that's a really nice way of saying that they really don't believe the Bible. Uh, they believe in community and spirituality, uh, but the Bible only inspires. And we would disagree with that when that we would say that the Bible is the authority uh, of our lives. It goes on to say there about one of her congregants, a man by the name of Perrin Allen, who grew, said he grew up in a conservative Christian household in Mississippi, but as a gay man, he struggled to feel accepted by his community. I was a Baptist Christian, and uh, so the way we saw things, the way they communicated, you had to do the things of the way the Bible says literally. But I feel, those are key words there, right? But I feel that the Bible and Jesus believe in love no matter what, and I feel like uh, that at the middle, it's all about love and love, period, said Alan. Uh, and so it's interesting because as I, I looked at that, it uh, was relevant to where we come to here in Galatians chapter 1. And so it kind of with that as a backdrop, and I think that's probably a good representation of many people today in modern religion. Um, I, I would not use the term Christianity because I don't believe that they are Christians uh, with that. Um, it shows kind of where we're at. And it's interesting to see that because the problem that we're facing today, while it may be new to us, is not necessarily a new problem. And Galatians chapter 1 really begins to help us to begin to see some of that. So we're going to read Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, and then understand uh, both where we are today in light of Scripture and where we should be. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into grace to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be a curse. As we have said before, so now I say it again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. As we look at this passage, there's three things we're going to begin to kind of look at. The first part here, we just want to get this passage, is to understand the greeting from Paul. And uh, the greeting from Paul, here's the first part of the passage in verses 1 and 2. Uh, it just gives us a little bit of a background of who it is. And so obviously, as we look at this, this gospel, or this, uh, sorry, epistle, not a gospel, this epistle was written by the apostle Paul. Now, you'll notice he, he highlights a couple of things. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men, 
but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me. Um, it's interesting as we look at this uh, letter, uh, just some of the background just to help you understand a little bit where it comes from. This letter was written about A.D. 49. Uh, that makes it one of the first letters in the New Testament. It's interesting, it's a different style for the Apostle Paul. If you're familiar with a lot of the Apostle Paul's letter, you read some of his other epistles, uh, you'll know that um, as was the common in their day, uh, they would announce who the author of the letter was right there at the beginning. Right? We, we usually write the author of the letter at the end, right? When we start a letter, we'd say who it is written to, uh, dear so-and-so, Hi, how are you? you know, and if you've ever taken a letter writing class, you know, you're never supposed to start a letter that way, but that's the way that we always start a letter, right? Um, and so, hi, how are you? And we tell about how our day is, and then it would put at the end, right, sincerely your friend and Stephen Carter. You'd write that right at the end. The ancient way of writing a letter was just kind of the opposite. Right at the beginning, you would say, Stephen Carter sends greetings to... And so right from the beginning, because, you know, what, what do we do if we don't see who the return address is, we don't know who it is, when we get that letter, what's the first thing that we do, right? Who, who wrote the letter? I, I want to know who wrote it, because how, who wrote the letter kind of uh, changes how I respond to the letter. And so Paul's saying here, this is Paul, an apostle, writing to the churches here at Galatia. So he's an apostle, and he highlights this, that he's not appointed by men, but appointed by God. And we'll come to that a little bit later as so we study the apostle, why is this Paul's apostleship such a big deal? But very basically, he's emphasizing the fact that the message that I'm giving to you is not my message. This is not my opinion. This is not, we've kind of you know, stuck our finger to the wind and this is what all the churches around us are doing. And so we kind of think this is a good thing to do. No, he's saying that this is a message from God to you. Uh, and so I want you to get God's message. And then he also says this, Paul and Apostle, with the saints, all the brethren who are with me. And I think it's a great message there uh, that Paul brought others along with him, not just for the traveling, for the journey, but the idea that Paul was involved in discipleship. And that idea of discipleship is that he encouraged and he brought others along with him. So when he was going on these missionary journeys, he brought others along, not just to keep them company so that they would learn how to minister. And then later on, we know that uh, when they kind of came to a place of maturity or readiness, he would either leave them in those places or he would send them off to those places. Uh, but it gives us a great challenge, and the challenge is, is this. Who are you bringing along with you? As you follow and worship Jesus Christ, who are you bringing along with you? Uh, our relationship should never be about just Jesus and me. Like, I met my Jesus and me. We had a great time. I read my Bible. God really blessed me. Now, our relationship should be about Jesus and me and who I'm bringing along with me. That I'm called to not only be discipled, but also to be discipling others as to say, come along with me as we worship Jesus Christ together. And so he's saying all the brethren who are here with me, whether it's at the churches or whether it's the fellow laborers, he said they're sending their greeting as well. And I think it challenges us to say, who are you bringing along with you? And then he says... I'm sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. Now, it sounds like a very simple uh, greeting there. We uh, understand who that is. But as we study this, we know that as you study this, there's a little bit of discussion who the exact recipients of the letter were. Are we talking about the people of North Galatia or the people of South Galatia? That kind of gets a little bit lost on us. But in their day and age, there was both a political region called Galatia, and there was an ethnicity of people called Galatia. They were Gauls that had come from France, from the region of Europe, and had migrated here to this place in Turkey, modern-day Turkey today, uh, and they were known as Galatians. They had done that about 300 years before this letter was written. Um, and so uh, there was a region where they reigned that was Galatia, that's North Galatia. And if you uh, were to look at your map here uh, today, you'll see right up here, uh, we have this area of Galatia. But Galatia kind of stretched, if you can see those lines, all the way down to here. And this was a little bit more the ethnic area of Galatia. Uh, and so as we study this, who is it talking to? We have what we call the North Galatian idea and the South Galatian idea. The North Galatian idea, if you study your New Testament, was where Paul ministered in the second missionary journey. Uh, and so if it's the people of the North Galatia, the political region of Galatia, 
Uh, it would be a later date. It would be after Paul's second missionary journey where he's addressing the churches that he started there in his second missionary journey. I believe that probably the better idea is this is what we call the South Galatian idea, where uh, the cities such as Libby, Lystra, Derby. Oh, let me go back here again. Sorry. Um, Lystra and Derby were part of that. Lystra, Derby, and Iconian were part of Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. He went to those areas and he started that church. And uh, it was shortly after leaving that region that false teachers came in and began to teach false doctrine that Paul sends this letter to correct this false doctrine. And that puts us there into that date of Acts, uh, sorry, of about AD 49. Um, this was a circular letter written to the churches of the region because the false doctrine that was coming was affecting those churches there in that region. Uh, oftentimes we see that, right? Uh, one false doctrine doesn't often just impact one area. It begins to spread. And Paul writes to them. One of the things he says is, I, I want you to know the grace and the peace that comes from God. And this is more than a, a greeting. I don't know if you, you've ever written a letter, and as you write a letter, you, sometimes you agonize over what is the greeting. Do I write this sincerely? Am I sincere about what I'm writing? Or do I, I say, yours truly, but I'm not really theirs, or maybe I'm a, a upset or something, so I don't want to write you. And so... This is more than just a greeting where Paul says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul's ministry and mission in life was about. Paul desired people to experience the grace that comes from God. It's central to the theme of the gospel. And so that's what we see, right? Uh, it is both the means and the result of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The means is the grace of God that uh, we experience the good news, the salvation that God offers through His grace, and it results in peace, both peace with God, that we're no longer at enmity with God, we're no longer rebelling against God, but we have that reconciliation and peace with God. And when we have that reconciliation and peace with God, we can experience the peace of God, that we can have God's peace there in our life. And so this is often the central theme of Paul's ministry. Matter of fact, if you read all of Paul's epistles, almost all of them begin with some form of this, grace to you and peace, grace and peace to you. Uh, that idea. It's who he, uh, it's what he wanted them to know. And then he goes on to say there, right, in verse uh, 4, uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. Uh, he gives them the basics of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of the message that we share. Why does he kind of give this to them? I've been told, and we've shared this before, that when they're training bank tellers to recognize counterfeit, they don't teach them what counterfeit is. They don't give them a whole bunch of counterfeit bills and examples of counterfeit bills and lay them out and say, this thing, you, know, you can recognize this one by this. Uh, one of the ways that they teach bank tellers to recognize counterfeit is, is for the first several weeks, all they do is they have them handle real money. Uh, they get to feel real money. They, they handle it so much that they become kind of just familiar with it just by the feel of it. And then what they'll do is, after a while that they're so familiar with the real money, is then they'll slip a counterfeit in. And as they're counting that, all of a sudden they'll, they'll recognize something doesn't feel right. It's not the same weight of paper. It's not the same feel. It's not the same consistency. Something's different with that. And because they recognize the real, they can recognize the wrong. And so the same is true with this. Paul's saying, here is what the simple gospel message is, that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins to rescue and deliver you from this present sinful age and to give you to God. That's the core of our message. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. The apostle Paul shares that, right? So if you were to ask to tweet out, and I don't know what is it, 160 characters for a tweet. I'm not, it may have changed nowadays. I don't do Twitter, so... Um, if you were asked to give a tweet or one or two sentence description of what is the gospel, how would you declare it? Here, First Peter, or first, or first Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse three, Paul says this: "For I delivered to you first that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and rose again the third day, according to the Scripture." If you look at those two verses, you'll understand that every phrase is heavy and weighty in those two verses. That Christ died for our sins. It was our sins that caused them, that we all 
are rebels against God, and because we've rebelled against God, that we are under the weight and the judgment of sin, that we have no ability to rescue and deliver ourselves, all of us, every one of us. And so Jesus Christ came to die in our place to be our substitute so that he could forgive our sins and rescue us and bring us back to God. All of this was according to God's plan there in the scripture. He rose again to give us new life. This is the gospel message. And Paul wants them familiar with this good news. Jesus died to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Matter of fact, if you read your New Testament, right, all throughout the New Testament is the central theme. Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus Christ came to give, not to serve, but to uh, be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You come there to uh, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. It's by his wounds we are healed. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, that Christ died for the ungodly. And Titus 2, verse 14, that Jesus Christ gave himself for us. And we can go on and on and on throughout the New Testament. This is the central theme. This is the central message of the New Testament. Jesus died to deliver us from our sin. Amen. And any time that we substitute or any time that we mess this or, or just begin to tweak it a little bit, you know, like uh, that's a really good message, but it's just missing a little bit. Uh, we distort and destroy and pervert it. And so we need to understand and realize this. This is the message of the gospel. Jesus died to deliver us from our sin. Amen. Now that he's denied to deliver us from our sin, we now live to bring glory to God. That's what he goes on to say there, right? For this is, right, to whom, talking about God the Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. That I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm now living uh, to bring honor and glory to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Uh, it also is the central message of the gospel, right? This is what uh, distinguishes Christianity from all the other religions of the world. Religion is man's attempt to get to God. That, uh, through our wrongdoing, we are separated from God. And through religion, we're working now to get our way back to God. And so you, you can substitute whatever religion that is. Christianity is unique and distinct and different than this, in that it is not man's attempt to get back to God. It's God's attempt to rescue and deliver man. You see, religion starts with man's initiative, recognizing who we are, where we are, we're trying to get back to where God is. Whereas Christianity says this, that God saw us there in our need, and God stepped out of glory, came to earth, died in our place, so that he could bring us back to him. And so when we recognize that, we understand that all the glory belongs to God. I didn't do anything, it's not through my works, it's not through my great faith. It's not through my great abilities that I, I'm now a great Christian. No, it's all because of what God's done. God has done it all. I've received it as a gift by grace. Uh, I, I have no glory to boast in. All glory goes to Jesus Christ. And we understand that because when we realize that he's done it all, all glory goes to him. If we begin to distort this, if we begin to mess with this, what are we doing? We're robbing glory from God and bringing it back to ourselves and saying, I deserve the glory. I deserve the glory because of how great of a person I am, because of the great works that I've done, because of how well I keep the law, because so many times I go to church and look what glory, I mean, like, pat me on the back, what a great person I am. No. We're sinners separated from God who couldn't rescue and deliver ourselves. Jesus Christ rescued us. We receive that gift by faith. All the righteousness we have is the righteousness that he's given to us. We have nothing to boast of in and of ourselves. All of our boasting and glory in is in Jesus Christ. And so he says, all glory goes to God. And he begins to give us the problem, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the problem. The problem is they began to mess with and distort the gospel. Not long after the Apostle Paul started these churches and he continued there on his missionary ministry and went into other areas to begin to plant other churches there, some false teachers crept into these churches. And uh, we would call these false teachers, we call these false teachers uh, Judaizers. Uh, and the Judaizers would say, well, that man, that message that Paul preached about Jesus Christ, that's, that's a great message. And, and man, that, that's wonderful what Jesus Christ did for you, but well, that, that's... It's just not quite enough. Like, that's good. Believe that. But you, you need to have this as well. 
And what they were saying that you need to have as well as this is they're saying like, yeah, Jesus Christ helps you on the way, but you're not really saved. You're not really right with God until you're circumcised, until you keep the law and the Ten Commandments. We would call this legalism. And sometimes we use that word legalism a little bit loosely nowadays. Uh, anytime somebody has a standard that we don't like, we say, oh, you're legalistic. But legalism really means somebody who is trying to earn the favor with God by keeping some set of standards. For them, it was the Old Testament Jewish law and circumcision in particular. They were saying, look, uh, you're not really right with God until you're circumcised. Once you're circumcised, then you're right with God. Yeah, Jesus Christ helps you, but he's, he's not enough. You've got to do a little bit more than Jesus Christ. Amen. What we see is this, right? That we abandon the gospel anytime we add or we take away from the gospel, right? We're not helping. God didn't like, man, he got it pretty close. Let me just tweak it a little bit here because God just needs a little bit of help. No, God doesn't need our help with this, right? The Apostle Paul says there in verse 6, and this is, if you're studying this, you know that Galatians is unique in this and that Paul does not send any praise or any type of uh, kind of commendation to this church. This is kind of straight into the problem, and Paul is pretty bold and blunt and straight into the problem in that he says this, I marvel that you are so soon turning away from the grace, or, uh, from him who has called you into the grace of God to a different gospel. I I'm amazed, guys, that you guys have left the truth and you've left Jesus Christ and now you've gone to a different gospel. Uh, what we realize is this, uh, any time that we mess with the gospel, we leave the gospel. They weren't leaving a set of beliefs. They were leaving a person, and the person was Jesus Christ. They were leaving Jesus Christ to go to a different or another gospel. And he points out the fact there is no other gospel. What you're leaving is not the gospel. You're not gathering or gaining anything. You're losing by what you're adding to this. Anytime we try to add or to take away from the gospel, we distort and pervert the gospel. We study religion today. You know and understand <coughs> that there are several other things that people call gospels today. Um, some believe and practice what they call the social gospel. And the social gospel says that man is really not that bad. He's really kind of a good person that if we could just uh, change his environment, we could rescue and deliver man. That's kind of what that pastor there from that church was preaching, right? The Bible's interesting, inspirational. It's not necessary. Uh, let's look to what culture says. And let's, let's talk about what, how we need to change culture and how we need to change uh, society. And if we change society, we'll rescue and deliver man. That's the social gospel. It fails to recognize that we are sinners separated from God, and our greatest problem is not society, right? Our greatest problem is that we're going to spend eternity separated from God forever in hell. And unless we get rescued and delivered from that, it does not matter whether we live a, a more prosperous life or whether we, we live a more pleasant life. Eternity is what's important. Some would look to the social gospel. Some would believe in a, a liberal gospel where... Uh, sin's not that big of a deal. Jesus Christ is not God. His death on the cross was not necessary. Uh, that, you know, we, we can just kind of do good and we'll improve and get better and better. And God's, you know, judgment of God is not something to be afraid of. Some practice the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel says that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to make you wealthy and healthy. And that if you just believe in what Jesus Christ can do for you, you can have a brand new car and a brand new house. If you just name it and claim it, that's not the gospel either. Right? That's not what Jesus Christ, he didn't come to make you wealthy and healthy. He came to deliver you from your sin and to put you in a right relationship with God. He came not to make you happy, but he came to make you holy. Amen. The cults distort the gospel. And that they say, well, Jesus Christ was a, a good example. He gave us a wonderful example of who God is and what God could be. But he wasn't really God himself. His death was uh, how we should endure suffering. And it, it's helpful. 
but it's not sufficient. We say, no, our salvation is dependent upon Jesus Christ, on Christ and on Christ alone. It is not of what we do, that he died to redeem us. Here's the reality. If we take away from the gospel, we pervert and distort the gospel. If we say that you know, Jesus Christ wasn't necessary, that we don't need a redemption and salvation, that we're okay on our own, and if we can just go ahead and rearrange things, we've lost the gospel. If we add to the gospel is to say, well, Jesus Christ's death was good, it's helpful, but you need this as well as. You know, you need to, to join our church. You need to join this group. You need to do these actions. We've distorted and taken away from the gospel. What we realize is this, only truth can compromise. It's the idea of this, right? If I were to give you a glass of water today, you're thirsty and, and you hadn't had a drink of water for a while and you say, can you give me a glass of water? I'd be happy to give you a glass of water. I go to the tap and I give you a nice big glass of cold water. I like a little bit of ice in my water. I give you a nice big glass of ice water. Uh, you would drink that. That'd be refreshing. That's necessary for life. But if I were to add just a little bit of arsenic to that water, just a couple of drops, you know, not, not much at all, are you willing to drink the water now? You see, just adding a little bit destroys and takes away from it completely. That life-giving function that it gave before now is removed, and rather than giving life, it destroys life. And the same is true with us. It, the gospel by itself gives life, but when we add to it, we don't help it any. We destroy it. And so they tried adding to the gospel. We live in a world today where people choose the gospel based upon how they feel. Did you catch that there in that article? I talked about that young man who was part of that church, and he said that he used to go to a church where you had to believe the Bible, but that's not what he feels anymore. He feels it's about love. The central message is about love, and so therefore he gave up that stuff because it's about how he feels. And that's the world in which we live today. We, we live in a world where people decide what's real based upon how they feel. Uh, this is what I feel. And so, uh, you know, I, my feelings is the source of all truth. And that's a dangerous place to be. Our feelings, while they're important, are not the source of truth. We need to come to the source of truth and to say, what has God said? This is why the Apostle Paul was saying, I'm an apostle, I'm not chosen by man. I didn't appoint myself. A group of guys didn't get around me, put their hands on me and say, okay, Paul, you're an apostle now. He said, no, God called me. God gave me this message. And he'll later go on to say that the message I received is not man's message. This is God's message for you. This is why it's important that we realize that this is not just a book. Another great source of inspiration and encouragement and enlightenment no, this is God's revealed truth to us. What that man rejected is what we need to hold to. This needs to be accepted and believed because this is God's message to us. Amen. When we abandon, or we abandon the gospel, that's what he said, I'm surprised you're so soon turning away. You've abandoned, you've left the truth when you embrace some other gospel. What we also see is this. When we distort the gospel, it results in condemnation. This is an important message for us to realize, that when we distort the gospel, it results in condemnation. Any perversion of the gospel destroys the gospel. When we add to it a little bit, or when we take away from it a little bit, what we get is something that destroys men's souls and results in people going to hell. It takes away from and distorts and destroys. And so that's why the Apostle Paul would say very strongly, right? This is, not, this is not politically correct what he's saying here. What is he saying? He's saying, let those guys who are teaching some other gospel, let them go to hell. That's what he's saying. He said, let them be accursed. They are separated. This is an, uh, the, the Greek word here is anathema. They are separated from God. Let them be cursed for what they're doing. Why is he saying this so strongly? Because what he realizes is, is that when you distort the gospel, it results in people going to hell. It's not just, oh, you know, they, they just see things a little bit differently than us. They, 
They, you know, they, they don't quite understand it the same way that we understand. We understand that there's some things that uh, good people disagree on and that we can have the freedom to disagree. We can disagree on church government. If you don't believe in a congregational system of government, but that you believe in the, the elders running the church or in the, having bishops running the church, we can disagree on the system of church government. That doesn't result in somebody's salvation being lost. But when you distort the deity of Jesus Christ, when you distort the atoning work of Jesus Christ, when you say that something is needed beyond faith to receive the gift of salvation, you are distorting the central message of Jesus Christ, you are sending people to hell. And that's why the apostle Paul would say, let those who preach the gospel experience condemnation. Let them be cursed by God because the error that they're doing is sending people to hell. And that's a bold statement. As we look at that, I think we, we need the wisdom and compassion to be able to discern between those who have been led into error and those who are misleading others. Sometimes we'll come across some people, maybe it's family members, maybe it's friends, maybe it's co-workers, uh, and they've been led into error. And so what do we want to do with them? We want to pray for them. We want to take them back to the Scriptures. We want to encourage and lead them into the truth. And if they've been led into the error to where um, they've uh, kind of been misdirected, we hopefully can regain them. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Timothy, right? Uh, uh, just skips my memory there for the moment, but directing them back into the truth. We, we want to regain those who have kind of erred from the truth. But there are some who know the truth, who know what the Scripture teaches, and intentionally teach something else. And they're intentionally misleading others. What do we do with those folks? We separate from them, and we have no part with them. We do it for the purpose of, of love and compassion, hoping to rescue those that they're misleading and hopefully ultimately rescuing them if they'll recognize their error and come back to the truth. When we distort the gospel, it results in condemnation. Thirdly is this, why do we struggle with this? Why is this a problem for us? Because we don't want to be mean or unkind today. Right? That's, as we look at this, a growing number of, we kind of look at the, the growing number of false gospels out there, the false teachings out there, and uh, somebody comes and uh, they're uh, one of our co-workers, maybe a family member, and says, you know, I don't believe the Bible anymore, and I'm kind of I'm embracing this alternative lifestyle, and I, I think you should accept that. And we go, oh, that's wonderful for you. I'm so proud of you. You live your truth. That's sending them to hell when we do it that way. What do we need to do? I, I'm not advocating here, okay? I'm not advocating that we be unkind and cruel and we say mean things and think that we're... But what I'm saying is this. The question is, who are we living to please? I, I, you can kind of hear them recoiling there in verse 9 as to say, Paul, you're cursing these teachers. Are these, these are guys that we like. I mean, We've obviously been listening to them. We were even believing in some of what they're saying. And all of a sudden you're saying, Paul, let them go to hell because of what they're teaching? Paul, that, that's not very nice of you. Uh, we, we don't use that type of language here in our church, Paul. Um, we, we believe, you know, kind of live and let live and, and everybody should live their truth. And what does Paul say in verse 10? Or do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. The problem that we have with defending the truth today is we want to be kind and caring. We want people to think of us as nice people. And so when we disagree, we don't say anything. And worse yet, oftentimes we even condone and validate wrong choices because we want to appear kind. When we do so, who are we living to please? Are we living to please the people who are rebelling and rejecting what God said? Or are we living to please God? We can disagree kindly. I think of it this way. 
We had a lot of rain this past weekend, and uh, let's say that you were on one of these back Indiana roads. You're coming to one of those roads that cross a river, and as you get ready to cross the river, right before you get to there, you recognize that the river's raging, and as the river's rage, it's washed out the bridge. By the grace of God, you're able to stop in time, and, and uh, now you kind of just have to decide what to do. Well, hopefully, you know, one of the first things you do is you get on your cell phone, you call the police, and you report there's a bridge out, we need to come stop that. And so while you're waiting for the, the roads department to come and the police department to come, uh, you're sitting there beside the road. And as you're sitting beside the road, you notice other cars are coming your direction. Now, if you are a kind, caring, compassionate person, what you will do is you'll take your car and you'll drive it back up the road a little bit. You'll position it in the road so that people can't get past it to stop them from going down that road. But let's say you're, you, you've kind of stopped there, you're flagging people down, and all of a sudden a guy comes up next to you and he's got a big pickup truck, and, and uh, you say, hey, you can't go this direction. Hey, you're not going to tell me what to do. Who are you to tell me how to live my life? I'm going to live my life however I want. I'm free, man. This is America, man. You don't tell people what to do here. But you say, no, you don't understand. It's dangerous. No, I, I'm going to do what I want to do. Don't tell me what to do. i got a big enough truck to take care of it. You, do you step back and just say, look, hey, buddy, you know, you're an adult. You know how to live your life. You live your own truth. You just do whatever you want to do. Or do you continue to persuade them to the best of your ability not to go ahead, knowing that if they continue down that road, it's sure destruction. What is the most loving thing to do? Is it loving to say to them, look, this is a wonderful road. And I'm sure it'll lead you to happiness. And so you, you do the things that just make you happy. You just, you just be happy here with this, knowing that it'll lead to their death. Or do you, even if they reject you, in love, seek to persuade them to say, you can't go this way. You see, there's a bad news aspect to the gospel, right? The bad news aspect of the gospel is all of us are sinners and that sin causes us to experience the wrath and the judgment of God. Not one of us are better than the other. Like, we don't rank our sin as to say, your sin is really bad. My sin's okay. No, no, we're all sinners, and all sin places us under the wrath and the judgment of God. And unless we repent and believe in Jesus Christ, we're going to experience the wrath and the condemnation of God forever called hell. That's the cliff that we're driving towards. And unless somebody comes and gets in your way and says, you need to turn around and you need to go back this way and go to Jesus Christ, and he's the only one that can rescue and deliver you, uh, we're headed towards that condemnation. The loving, kindest thing we can do is to call people towards repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Even if they don't agree with it or like it. Paul says, I'm going to seek to please men. I'm going to seek to please God. I can't do both. Who are we ultimately living for? As we come to the end of this passage, let me challenge you with two things. The first question is this. Have you experienced the salvation offered by Jesus Christ, the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Have you been redeemed from your sin? and experience the salvation that he offers, and you accept it by faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's not about what we do, it's about what he's done for us. And, and if you haven't, I, the most loving thing that I can do this morning is to get in your way, to get in your face, and to say, you need to turn. You need to turn from your sin, and you need to turn to Jesus Christ and receive his gift of salvation, because if you don't, the road you're on leads to destruction. And, and it's not because I'm trying to be unkind or mean, it's because I love and care for you that I want to turn you back to life. The second thing is this, what price are we, as the followers of Jesus Christ, willing to pay to pursue and to protect the gospel? Because we live in a day and age, as if you read this article, you understand that, that not one of those people in that article had the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was the sad truth, right? Are we willing to pursue the truth? Are we willing to protect the truth? Because there's a lot of people today that say, I just, that's, that's not how I feel. 
And I, I feel like this is what God is all about. This is what Jesus is. And they get a partial picture, and a partial picture is a complete error. Right? A partial salvation is no salvation at all. Arsenic mixed with water is not refreshing. Yeah. And the same is true that when we distort the gospel, it's not like, you know, they're, they're halfway there, they're okay. Halfway there is to be completely lost. Are we willing to pursue and to protect the gospel of Jesus Christ? God, thank you for giving us this wonderful truth. That you have not left us to grope in the dark and to discover our own way back to God. But God, that you have given us the illumination and you have given us the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, may we pursue and protect that truth. May we realize that you have given us the light and life that is available in Jesus Christ. And God, may we live that out in our life, and may we lovingly tell others about it as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stand and invite you to make a decision this morning. If you don't know Christ as Savior, as we begin to sing, we'd love to be able to share this morning how you can be turned from that path of destruction back into that place of life and reconciliation. God's laid somebody on your heart this morning and maybe there's somebody that you want to pray for. The altars are open. You can come and you can pray for that person that they too can be turned back towards the truth. God's causing, calling you to make some other spiritual decision. You respond as God calls you to respond together this morning. Let's stand together this morning. The Savior is waiting, 412. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? has waited before and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door oh how he wants to come in if you'll take step toward the Savior, my friend. You'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart he'll abide. Time after time he has waited before and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door oh how he wants to And I pray this morning that before you would leave, that you would make sure that you have that issue settled. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if you haven't, we want to take that opportunity to invite you to do that this morning. It's our privilege this morning to introduce a young couple to you this morning. I'm going to ask John and Miriam to come this direction this morning. John and Miriam have come this morning to request membership here at Inglewood Baptist Church. Uh, they both accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've both been baptized. Uh, and so we would like to uh, take the opportunity to welcome them here this morning. Uh, we hope that you get to know them. Uh, they also had their young daughter here with us this morning. And uh, uh, <laughs> they are soon learning that um, when you become parents, your identity gets lost and you become the parents of uh, someone. So 
Uh, but we're glad to have them here. That They have asked membership here this morning with us. And so we'd like to take the opportunity, if you're all in favor of receiving John and Miriam as members of Inglewood Baptist Church, if you would say amen. Amen. And uh, if you're opposed, there's the door. No. <laughs> uh, we're glad to be able to welcome them here this morning. And uh, we're excited what God's going to do to be able to have them come alongside of us and to become part of us and to worship with us and serve the Lord together with us as we have the opportunity to come alongside of them to be an encouragement and a family and a blessing to them to help uh, each other grow closer towards Jesus Christ this morning. Let me take the opportunity to, to pray uh, here this morning, to pray over them here this morning. Lord, we uh, want to thank you for John and Miriam for their commitment to follow Jesus Christ this morning, to uh, raise up Claire here in a Christian household to follow Jesus Christ as well. Lord, just pray that you just be with them. We thank you for their decision this morning to commit and to follow Jesus Christ here at Inglewood Baptist Church. And so, God, we pray that you would just be with them as they uh, become members here of Inglewood, that you would help them to uh, kind of to come alongside, to be a part of, and to uh, experience the community life here of Inglewood. Lord, that we'd also, as a church, would come alongside of them, that we would be an encouragement and a blessing to them, and that, God, that we'd experience that family that you've called us to be part of. Lord, uh, may we live that out here in the community that you've placed us to bring honor and glory to you. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to ask them to uh, just to kind of stay here in the, the front pew just a moment. Let me uh, have you take your seats for just a second. Uh, in, in just a few seconds, we're going to give them the right hand of fellowship and welcome them here. And so... Uh, if you just come alongside of them and shake their hand and welcome them when we dismiss this morning. Let me share just a couple of announcements here as we close out this morning. Claire was not quite sure about that there. <laughs> uh, a couple things uh, that I want to share with you here this morning is this is obviously our giving and, and we're grateful for your faithfulness to give. The two opportunities, the boxes are back in the foyer and down in the hallways there. You can give electronically or, or uh, we know that some of you have been faithful to give by mail, and we're grateful for that, grateful for your faithfulness to support the ministry uh, here at Inglewood. Um, you obviously, we're starting here in Galatians next week. Come back to join us to the second half of Galatians chapter 1 as we continue our way here through the, the book of Galatians. I think Galatians is an important study because of this. One of the things that you'll, we come across here, this is the problem of workspace salvation. And I think every Christian somewhere along their line uh, struggles with how am I accepted by God? Am I accepted by God because of the grace that He gives and the favor that's bestowed upon us because of Jesus Christ? Or do I earn my way there some way? And one of the things that we want to realize is this, is that we are accepted by God, that, that we receive this salvation exclusively by the grace of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us on our behalf. It's not about what we do. It's about what He's done for us. Uh, and it's a faith-based salvation on the grace of God. And so I want to encourage you to come and, and to be a part of that as we study that there together. But secondly, is this is for our men. I want to encourage you January 21st and 22nd. Some of you pointed out last week uh, there was a little bit of a kind of discrepancy between the calendar and this. Uh, the 21st and 22nd is the date. And so we need you to sign up by next week, January 9th, if you want to come and to be a part of that. Uh, we'll have a great time fellowshipping together and also being discipled uh, together. Uh, it, uh, we'll be leaving Friday afternoon, getting back Saturday afternoon. Our last session is at 4 o'clock on Saturday. It's uh, there at Highland Lakes, which is right in between Monroe, the, uh, Mooresville and Martinsville, not Monroe. Uh, Martinsville and Mooresville uh, there at Highland Lakes Baptist Camps about an hour away. I want to encourage you to come and to be a part of that. And then January 31st, we have our fifth Sunday fellowship and we'll uh, share a little bit more with that as we come a little bit closer there to that. Let me share with you the blessing that comes from God's Word this morning. In Jude chapter 1, it reminds us of this. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before His presence of His glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Before you leave... Come and give John and Mary the right hand of fellowship and welcome them here to Inglewood Baptist Church, but you were dismissed this morning.